Right, so hi everyone um, and welcome to the fourth in our uh, series of super facility uh, demos. Um, super facility project um, is uh, designed to help support um, experimental science um, at uh, Berkeley Lab and uh, within the DOE complex and it uh, is coordinating work and efforts um, in CRD and ESNS and at NERSC um, in supporting these workflows and supporting these very data centric um, workloads. Um, and so we've been uh, running as a project now for um, uh, something like a year and a half and we've organized this demo series to um, to share and to show off a little bit some of the work that's gone in um, gone into the super facility project um, and some of the tools and some of the capabilities that we've been developing uh, to support this workload. So today's topic is uh, SPIN. Uh, SPIN is a container platform um, at NERSC um, and we are uh, uh, excited to have um, not just uh, staff from NERSC but also from the LZ experiments um, as part of this demonstration. So I'm going to turn it over to Corey, Quentin and Tyler now to um, introduce, the, uh, introduce the topic. Hi everybody, uh, thanks for attending the talk. So, um, so what we're going to do today is give you just a, a brief kind of overview of the SPIN platform. Uh, at NERSC and I'll give a short demo that shows how a simple service is created really quickly and then um, Quentin and Tyler are going to get on to the more interesting or more, at least more, more sciencey part of it which is showing what they've been able to do um, with, uh, with the LZ experiment and some services that are running in SPIN uh, including a really interesting background about uh, what the experiment is, is doing and how the science of the project works. Okay, so you're familiar with NERSC, um, and one of the characteristics of, of NERSC's work, workload and the number of different projects and users uh, that we support is its diversity. And a part of, the, part of what comes with that and makes it fun to work at NERSC is the, the number of different kinds of experiments and workflows and research that, that we help to support. Um, Part of what comes along with that uh, diversity of workload is the need for services and other kind of um, and other kind of science gateways and other resources, uh, in addition to just the uh, to the HPC work that's done. So in addition to compute, this is our motivation for creating a platform like Spin, where those kinds of uh, auxiliary services can run alongside HP, HPC experiments. So this is sort of the impetus uh, behind creating SPIN is receiving questions from our users about how can I run some of my services in conjunction with my computational projects that access my data or can tie into the HPC networks and can scale up to uh, you know, commissioning a detector or operating it in, in um, real time at full volume. And by the way, I need to use custom software in these services and I need to have things stay up uh, outside of just when jobs are running. In fact, I might make, I even may need tools that do the job scheduling. And I need these things to stay up because the community that I'm working with is dependent on these. And these things fall outside of the normal HPC realm of of services and that's why we built SPIN to be able to support these kinds of things like databases or data archives, workflow managers or other web science, uh, websites or science gateways. <clears throat> that's what SPIN was designed to do. And it's a platform where users can deploy their own science gateways or these types of tools using Docker containers. And Docker is a really nice fit for this use case because it lets people who are developing software on these projects kind of control what's inside the Docker container, but deploy it to a managed infrastructure. And that's hard to do on any um, traditional sort of platform, uh, even a, a cloud kind of platform that's based on virtual machines. You can easily end up with, if you're a researcher, you can easily end up with far too much stuff to manage. You don't want to manage virtual machines. Essentially, you want to try and manage just, just the software. And Docker helps, helps make that possible. So in SPIN, 
you can use public or custom software images. And we'll show that. Uh, you can access the file systems and network here at NERSC. All the spin is off the HPC platform. It's tied into those resources. And you can use it to orchestrate complex net flow, net, um, workflows. Sorry. <clears throat> and all on a, plant, a managed platform that's secure and scalable and uh, run by NERSC. So as part of the super facility project, SPIN has helped to support some of our um, project engagements uh, like DESI and LZ, that's what we're highlighting today. And there are many uses of, of SPIN across NERSC's portfolio. We have over, uh, over 150 users and, uh, and over 100 different services that people are actively working with. <clears throat> So if you're familiar with Docker at all, you're probably familiar with this methodology of build, ship, and run. That's very compatible with how people use Spin. So building images, if you need custom software, you can do that on your laptop. You can ship them into uh, what's a registry, which is a Docker image repository for version control and safekeeping. We also support public repositories, uh, registries like Docker Hub. And then on the SPIN platform is where the workloads actually run. Uh, and that uses an orchestration system underneath called Rancher. <clears throat> Rancher is, you can sort of think of Rancher as the type of system that you need when you scale beyond just running a few containers on your laptop. Rancher is really what we need to be able to support this for a large number of users for a complex set of, um, set of services. <clears throat> so how does that actually work? How do you actually interact with uh, SPIN? So with, our, with the new version of Rancher that we just announced, uh, you can use a user interface. That's what the, the demo I'm about to do will show. <clears throat> or you can use YAML declarations. <clears throat> And there are some kind of toy examples for creating a Docker image uh, and also for describing how, how your um, application is constructed. And when you apply, you either build with a UI or apply those YAML rules <clears throat> to, to design a system like this, it manifests as running services. In, in the rancher environment within SPIN. So here's kind of a, a picture, a pictorial kind of example of a typical sort of service. So with, with a web front end, an application back end, maybe built with something like Flask, and a database, like MySQL or Postgres, and maybe a key value store thrown in as well, something like Redis or Memcache, something like that. So you can compose these things together, and then the Rancher orchestration takes care of, number one, plumbing a private overlay network between all of them, so they can communicate with each other, but they're isolated to themselves. And it also takes care of running those containers on the nodes within SPIN. You don't have to worry about where your node is running or where your container is running. You don't have to track that. Rancher takes care of all that for you. And also make sure that the containers stay running if they stop, restarts them, reschedules them. If we do maintenance on nodes, <coughs> the containers will be restarted on, on other nodes. So at a very high level, uh, the spin architecture looks something like this. And as you can see, there's <coughs> the, the aspects of it, that users operate are number one, of course, doing local development on a laptop uh, and interacting with SPIN through a management UI or CLI, and also through Docker to, to um, push or pull images from a registry that <clears throat> goes through our security policy enforcement. And then containers are deployed in the managed, in the managed instance. Uh, up at the top, an ingress is how services are made available such as a website to a user community and on the back end there are nodes running in spin 
the rancher takes care of uh, orchestrating containers onto. And there are resources at NERSC that are available, such as the community file system or local NFS storage that's present on the spin, and also the CDMFS distributed file system. <clears throat> so let me launch right in and uh, show you a demo of how you create a very simple service in SPIN. This is a recording um, of the process. And the service that I'm going to create is a Python application that, that um, <clears throat> is database driven and shows some cosmology images. So it's a very simple kind of toy example of a science gateway. So this is the Rancher user interface, and I'm going to click deploy to deploy a new workload. I'm going to call it DB because it's a database. <clears throat> and I'm going to use the provided MySQL image version 5. This is going to pull from Docker Hub. I'm going to put it in a namespace called demo that isolates it from other workloads that are, <clears throat> that are running in spin and supply a number of different variables that affect how, it cre how it's created, the database name, the username, the password. And then finally, I'm gonna apply some security policy to it to minimize <clears throat> the, the number of kind of uh, privileges that the container has. And this is part of our security in, in SPIN to um, run with least privilege. So the permissions that are being assigned here are the minimum for that MySQL image to start up. So you can see this is the fun part. In a number of seconds, I went from just giving a declaration to a running database. So now I'm going to deploy the Python application on top of that. <clears throat> I'm going to call that app because it's an application. And this is going to use a custom image that's part of our spin up training workshop. <clears throat> and this is the this contains the application that shows the uh, shows the cosmology images. I'm going to keep that app workload in the same demo workspace so it can talk to the database. <clears throat> and I'm going to supply as an environment variable the same password so that it can uh, authenticate to the database. And then I'll go down and add a community file system path as a mount into the container. And that's where the, the cosmology application will pull its images from. It has to be an existing directory. And here you're going to see the familiar path where the images are. <clears throat> this will reveal this uh, application was actually created by Roland Thomas, who's part of the spin working group. It's pulling out of his directory. That's going to mount inside serve static inside the container. <clears throat> and then last, I'm going to apply um, some more security settings to reduce the privilege in this, in this container. This container actually doesn't need any special privileges at all. <clears throat> okay, again, in a few seconds, that's running and ready and ready to use. And now the final step is to create the ingress, which essentially maps uh, a, a URL and a port that's available externally. I'm calling it LB because it's a, effectively a, a load balancer. And the host name that's going to be, that we'll use to access it, is kind of a predict predictable name based on the name of the ingress and the namespace and the development spin instance. That's going to, so port 80 on that host is going to connect to the app workload, port 5000. And then I'm going to do one little trick here to, uh, to set the DNS time to live on the dynamic record that's created. <clears throat> Now for this part, since there is a little bit of a delay while this, um, while this ingress is created, I'm going to fast forward by, uh, let's see, about 15 seconds. Okay, and then the ingress is now active. 
And so that means I can access that URL and I'm now, you can see the output of the science gateway and there's the cosmology images. <clears throat> so this application was created in advance uh, and it was created to populate the database on startup, but it is very much the case that we went from nothing to a running service in just under five minutes. So that's part of the fun with working with SPIN. And I'm gonna hand it over to Quentin now to talk about the LZ experiment and, um, <clears throat> and what they've done with SPIN. Uh, Quentin, do you wanna share? Yes, of course. Can you hear me well, by the way? Sure. Awesome. Okay, let me find the right tab. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes, we can see it. Awesome. So, um, my name is uh, Quentin Rifard. I'm a project scientist um, at LBL, uh, working for the LZ uh, experiment. And I'm going to show you um, a fast introduction about what we are doing and also uh, what is our um, usage of, uh, of NOSC. So let's start with some, um, some background. So in the universe, um, we have a few evidences of, um, of the existence of uh, dark matter. One of these is the rotation curves. So what you can see here on this, uh, on this animation is the simulation of the rotation of stars in a galaxy with uh, a halo of dark matter surrounding the galaxy and without uh, the dark matter in, uh, in, uh, in the galaxy. So what you can see here is without dark matter, what we are observing is that the stars at the center of the galaxy are rotating very, very, uh, very fast, very quickly, while um, on, the, on the arms of the galaxy far, far away from, from, the, um, from the galactic center, uh, the rotation, uh, the velocity of rotation of those stars is quite uh, quite small and we are expecting it based on just the luminous mass the rotation velocity decreasing as uh, the inverse of the square root of, uh, of the radius while when we have dark matter what you can see here is that the rotation velocity of the stars is more homogeneous at large radius and guess this is what we are observing so this is the measurements here the, the dots that, that you can see here and this is telling us that we have dark matter in, um, in the galaxy because this is uh, the only explanation that we can um, add on the top of it to explain why we are observing a plateau instead of a, of a decreasing that uh, like indicated here because this, this is the component just related to the, the, visible, uh, the visible matter. Um, we have um, a multiple, uh, multiple evidences of, uh, of dark matter, um, not only at the local scale, but uh, also at the universe scale. Um, and uh, here, this is another picture, at the galaxy cluster scale. So we have dark matter everywhere in uh, our universe. This is the, the take home message uh, of this. And here I just illustrate some of the most um, emblematic uh, one, but we have many more observations that support the existence of, uh, of dark matter. So the cosmology also informs us about the dark matter abundance and some measurements from the, the Planck satellite um, measure that today um, our universe is composed by about 26% of dark matter, which represents a large fraction of the universe content, while the matter, the regular matter, uh, the matter that we are touching every day, represents just about five, four percent. If we just uh, take the sum of the matter component, the dark matter represents 83 percent of the matter, which is the, the dark matter is dominating the, the matter. So we don't know anything about this. And in this puzzle of the dark matter, so we have here, uh, I really like this, uh, this, uh, this smaller diagram in, um, because it shows that this is just a part of the, what we call the visible matter, what we know, and this is uh, the dark matter. So the theorists um, worked very hard to create new particles new, um, for to be candidates as um, for the dark matter 
sector. And <clears throat> we, we don't know um, as of today which one is the good one. And then for that, we need to detect uh, the dark matter. And there are a few ways to detect dark matter. So this is an interesting diagram because we can read it in a few directions. So uh, we could first start to try to produce dark matter. So we just take two standard model particles like protons and we fuse them and we produce dark matter. So this is um, what LHC people are typically doing. And there are some LHC searches about dark matter. Um, as we have dark matter everywhere in the, in the universe, you could also expect that if the dark matter can uh, self-interact and also annihilate, uh, you could have fusion of dark matter particle and leading to the creation of standard model particle. This is the way that we call indirect detection and um, people are looking in the sky excess of a signal that could lead uh, to a dark matter um, interpretation. And then we have the direct detection way, which, um, which is we take uh, a detector made of standard model um, particles, like for example, um, heavy nucleus, like xenon, and, <coughs> excuse me, and we are looking for an interaction between these standard model particles, our detector, and the dark matter, the so-called direct detection. So this is uh, what the LC experiment uh, try, um, is intending to do. So so this is a diagram of the LZ experiment. So we have here uh, the TPC, the main TPC, that has seven uh, ton of liquid xenon inside the TPC. So the total um, liquid xenon volume will be uh, 10 ton. Uh, we have a skin and um, also an um, outside detector to avoid, um, to help to the discrimination of the different backgrounds, but I don't want to, to go too much in the detail. So right now the LZ detector is, um, on the on the mine at um, the surf um, the underground laboratory in South Dakota, and I I'm sorry, but I completely missed to to put uh, pictures of the um, of the detector right here. So if we just um, try to think about now, what is the expected signal in LZ? Is oops, I just wanted to start the video. Yes. Uh, we have a wimp or dark matter particle that uh, arrives. It interacts, and then here uh, we had the first flash of light in the detector, um, and this is going to create a small signal here. And then um, it creates also some electrons, and because we have an electric field, uh, the, those electrons are drifting toward the, um, the the liquid to reach here the um, the anode grid, and then. Let me pause on at the very end of the video. Oh gosh. Okay, so for some reason I can do that. But when the electrons arrive um, at the, um, on the anode grid, they will be amplified by a higher electric field and then they will emit a lot of, uh, of light. And this light uh, will be detected on the, on the PMT. So we are going to have a first uh, signal that is our uh, the signal that we're going to call S1 and then S2 later on that is going to be the ionization signal let's say uh, and this signal will also give us the capability based on its position and the different uh, uh, the different light observed on the different PMTs uh, we are going to be able to reconstruct also the position in the XY plane uh, of the events and thanks to the drift time um, because we know the electron drift velocity here, we can reconstruct the Z position. So here we have um, uh, the 3D position of the interaction and also uh, its energy uh, based on the S1 and S2 uh, amplitude. So the goal is of the um, offline um, uh, software in LZ is we have interactions, we have this pattern that you can see here on the PMTs, um, we have collected all those PMTs. Now, the DAQ assembled uh, everything and packed that in files. Uh, we send that to um, from SURF to NERSC, and then we copy that from, from NERSC to the UK uh, data center. And then we have to uh, apply some analysis, and then we get this uh, nice uh, plot. This is, this is simulation, by the way, uh, where we have the drift time as a function of the square of the radius here. And then we decide that this is the volume we, uh, we want to, to investigate for dark matter. And, and from this, we want to uh, be able to establish this, uh, which is the limit on the, 
the WIMP um, dark matter um, cross section. And for this is um, uh, extremely time consuming in terms of CPU hours. And this is uh, where NERSC is, um, is because we, from here to here, we are using NERSC uh, from, because we have the data transfer and we have also the processing of all the data. So we, we have a, a, a massive usage uh, of NERSC. And this is what I want to highlight with this, um, with this slide. So this is our estimated allocation uh, for, uh, the future and for the past years too. Um, and what you can see here is that we have a lot of uh, needs in terms of allocation because those numbers are million of CPU hours uh, as well. Uh, hours. And but thanks to the new tools that NERSC is setting up, um, the LZ collaboration is not, let's say, limited in CPU usage and data storage. We are using uh, uh, other services uh, provided by uh, by NERSC and SPIN is a very good services that we are using uh, a lot. Uh, we are using it for the data transfer because our software space is um, living on um, on SPIN. Um, we have the monitoring, the software monitoring for space that is also living on SPIN. Uh, the job our job submission engine that is now living on uh, on SPIN, uh, which is in P squared, and also it's monitoring. So you have here two screenshots of the of the monitors. Uh, we have the GDM viewer that uh, Tyler is going to introduce in a um, few minutes. Um, our frame software for the offline data quality monitor and also uh, some database mirrors that are, are also living on, uh, on spin. So the, the take home message here is that at the level of the MZ collaboration, we are uh, trying to use all the capabilities that uh, NERSC is, um, is willing to, to give us. And uh, for some of them, um, we had a very successful uh, usage of, uh, of SPIN. Okay, so Tyler, I'm just going to hand that to you now. Okay, thanks. Let me share my screen. And I'm also gonna share my computer sound. So uh, I just pre-recorded uh, this demo, like the other demo. Um, but I also talk in this video, so hopefully you can hear it. If you can't, uh, let me know and I'll just do it live. <laughs> but I introduced myself in the video, so I'll, uh, I'll let myself take it away. Hi everyone, this is Tyler Anderson. I'm a graduate student at Stanford studying physics and I work at Slack uh, as part of the LZ collaboration. And today I'm gonna to be showing off the LZ offline event viewer. Uh, which is one of the more visually interesting services that um, LZ has up on spin right now. Uh, we use it to look at raw data, uh, so like waveforms and PMT heat maps, and it's kind of the one service that I've been maintaining and uh, working on. So to start, it's a pretty simple web app uh, on spin. It's kind of split up into you know a web and an app service. Um, the web part uses a custom Nginx image that LZ has common between all of its spin services. And uh, the app part is served up uh, using a Python library called Boca, which is a nice interactive uh, data visualization library uh, that you can use through Python. So, um, to show off some of the features here, I uh, first just have to load up some data to look at. Um, so I'm going to look at just a pre-process file, but uh, meaning it's gone through all of our, our reprocessing software, but you can also look at just raw data and have the event viewer process it for you. And to do that, you can also control which version of the reprocessing software to use here. Um, but I'll just use a already processed file because um, it's a little faster. And it's nice here because Spin um, lets us mount all these volumes that uh, most of the collaborators are already using uh, in LZ. So most LZ people can just load up any file they're working on already in their own space and it'll just pop up on the event viewer. You don't have to worry about moving or transferring it anywhere. It's pretty nice. Uh, so 
you can see that once I open this file, a bunch of pretty colors popped up. Uh, and that's this first event in the file being loaded. You can see here uh, there are 74 events in this, this file. Um, so I'll give you a tour around the, the page here. In the top left, you have kind of just metadata about this first event. Uh, below, you have some waveforms. And then to the right, you have your PMT heat maps of uh, yeah, every part of the detector. So uh, I'll start with the waveforms. Um, and I'm only going to be focusing on the TPC waveforms. So that's this top one here. Uh, the other two correspond to waveforms from the outer detector parts, um, which are mostly used as veto. So I'll mostly focus on just the TPC. And in the PMTs, that's um, this top circle here and the bottom circle here are the top and bottom arrays of the TPC, which are a little more clear if I go to this TPC tab, and then you can only see those. So you have the top PMT array and then the bottom PMT array. Um, and these waveforms are summed up over all of the individual uh, PMT waveforms, at least on this tab. So uh, I'll use this waveform to kind of show some of the uh, things we just mentioned previously. So um, I believe we mentioned that most events are uh, give us two main signals, the S1 and the S2. Uh, the S1 is labeled in green here, so I'll show you what it looks like in a waveform. Um, S1 is created uh, kind of immediately after an, an interaction occurs in our detector, um, and it's <clears throat> just the scintillation light created in the interaction. Um, and you can see that these pulses are, these are actually two S1s, um, it is a uh, pretty tall and narrow pulse because all the light is created at roughly the same time and they all travel at the speed of light, so uh, they all hit the PMTs at about the same time. And if you look at the PMT arrays here, you can see that um, once I zoomed in, it updated to only show the uh, PMTs that were hit within this time range. Um, so you can see that the light is pretty well uniformly distributed. Um, and also mentioned that there's two S1s because uh, the specific interaction, uh, in the specific interaction, there are two things that happen kind of back to back. So um, I can reset here and then show that about 600 microseconds later, we have this new huge pulse and this other pulse is the S2, um, and during the 600 microseconds, the electrons actually drift up through the detector carried by the electric field to the um, liquid surface of xenon. And once they hit the liquid surface, I'll zoom in here, you can see um, the electroluminous and cross as they cross the um, detection field, you create a bunch of new photons. So. To show you this S2, I can actually use a new feature. Um, so I'll say this is pulse 20. And if I come up to pulse selection and just put in 20, it'll zoom to that S2 and tell you some nice information about it. Um, and I, you can see that it's a very wide pulse, and uh, there's a lot of there's a lot more photons of course that come from this pulse, uh, and it's very obvious when you look at the PMT array here. Um, and also looking at the PMTs, you can see that uh, through, um, well, you can see that we can get an idea of where the event happened uh, using uh, the idea that um, PMTs just above the interaction collect the most light. So just looking at this heat map, you can see, oh, this event probably happened uh, at this location in the detector, kind of near the edge of the detector, or the TPC. Um, and then you're probably curious what all this other stuff is below. Um, so if I zoom in on that, uh, it's mostly just single electrons that are kind of lagging behind. Um, and I'll use this opportunity to, opportunity to just show off, you know, this other feature where you can just do a custom 
uh, time range, or um, I also show off that the legend here is clickable. So if you wanted to only see, you know, these single electrons, which are labeled in red, you can click everything else, and then um, you just have these red dots where your single electrons are. So it's kind of nice if you're looking for a specific type of pulse. Uh, and finally, um, over here, you can also customize these, this uh, heat map color range. Um, so if I want the minimum to be you know, 100, it'll only show PMTs that um, have you know, more than 100 detected photons in them. Uh, and if I just figure that, it'll reset. So I mentioned before that these waveforms are um, are summed up over all of the individual waveforms from the PMTs. But if you wanted to look at one PMT's waveform instead, you can do that on this tab. So if I wanted to look at just the waveform coming from PMT 181, which is this guy here, I can enter that in and hit plot, and you'll just see that specific waveform. So this is kind of its contribution to the S2 pulse. Uh, another fun thing you can do is drag a region around the PMTs you want to plot and just hit plot highlighted PMTs and then it shows just those PMTs. So you can kind of see, get, that, get an idea of uh, summing up all these PMT waveforms to get kind of a much bigger uh, S2 pulse. So that's about all of the features I want to show off. Um, the last thing is just noting that you can move to different events within the file, uh, which is important. So if I put in two, it'll go to the second event in the file. Um, and when it does, it just you know changes, reloads all the waveforms and uh, all of this metadata. So that's it. Uh, let me just reiterate that the um, app part of this is made possible with Boca. Uh, which is a nice interactive tool. And uh, users can use this, all the LZ users can use this pretty easily because it's hosted on Spin. And Spin is very close to, or it lets them use all the data they, they'd normally be working with anyway. Um, so thank you. All right, uh, that was it. So I guess if it's fine by uh, Corey, I can just. Move to this last slide. Yep, thanks, Tyler. So uh, again, I want to thank Quentin and Tyler for uh, going into depth on the on the project and kind of and um, and showing the tools because um, it's it's very interesting for us to see how um, how you all are able to kind of apply these tools for in such creative ways, um, and that's. Um, so I'm seeing that detail for the first time myself too. So it's just, it's fascinating. Um, so I'll just kind of uh, briefly summarize here. Uh, there, there was a, just a little bit of sleight of hand in this talk in that the, uh, the instance of uh, spin that I featured earlier is our new one. And that's based on Rancher version two, which has Kubernetes under the hood. And that's actually being released now to early adopters. We did our first training workshop uh, in, at the end of April, and we're currently um, focusing on helping uh, users of SPIN that we're using Rancher version one, uh, which includes Tyler, <laughs> uh, to move over to uh, Rancher version two, which offers a, a number of new um, capabilities and and additional kind of flexibility in, in how things can be deployed. So if you're interested in using SPIN, uh, hopefully this talk kind of shows some of the, the variety of services that we're, that we're able to support and uh, definitely highlighted the, uh, the direct interaction with NERSC file systems. Uh, you can register for a SPIN workshop. The next one we've got is coming up in July. Uh, and then we have some throughout the year. If you're already a user of SPIN, I see a number of folks that are um, that are attending here that are. Uh, you should have received a notification that, that we're opening up uh, early access to Rancher 2. So you can get in touch with us 
and try that out. Uh, for new, years, new users, we do have a seminar that is instructor-led and leads you through interactive exercises to kind of um, get you started with using SPIN. And then we have a hackathon that's just free form that we staff uh, to kind of get, get your project launched. If you're an existing user, we're um, uh, opening access to Ranger V2 through a self-guided exercise. And then we have office hours as well to help out with um, your implementations there. And so, and if you're curious, you can look at, you can look more uh, at our webpage. Um, there's a little bit more detail about uh, the, the Rancher version one and Rancher version two instances, as well as some recordings and, and other information. And we have time for questions now. So um, I'm happy to hear questions about the project or about SPIN or uh, anything that you've seen and heard. Can I ask a question about the uh, the LZ service, the, the service deployment for LZ? So you didn't you didn't talk much about um, the interaction between the services running in SPIN and the rest of the center, but you mentioned, I think, Quentin, you mentioned P squared at the beginning. Are jobs being submitted directly from the SPIN services, or is there some other orchestration happening? like external to nurse or through cron jobs on core or workflow nodes that are making job submission happen? So at the moment, um, we don't have automatic uh, job submission to, to P squared. Um, we are just doing it by hand because we don't have uh, the data stream um, coming from, from so uh, yet. But, uh, uh, what we are going to do is when the data file will be um, written here at NERSC, um, we will have a hook that will tell to be square to put this file on the queue for processing. And that's going to be in SPIN or outside of SPIN? I think it's going to be inside of SPIN. Okay, thanks. Maybe this is a similar follow-up. I, I was just sort of wondering about the underpinnings of the like the event viewer. Is is all those are all those waveforms and the, those are already pre-calculated and and stored on the file system, or is it doing any kind of live um, analysis? Uh, it can do either. Um, the one I showed was something I've already processed, uh, and this it's all simulated data anyway. Um, but you can give it kind of unprocessed data and tell the event viewer to process it uh, and then show you all the waveforms and stuff. Does that take very long or is it, is it a, a quick thing? Uh, it depends on how many things you want it to process, but um, you know, it's less than a minute usually. Does, okay, does it do the processing in the spin container? Or does uh, it fire yeah. off something else? Okay. Yeah, it, um, there's a, we have software on, CVMFS, which is a file system. Um, yeah, I know. I'm, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, which can do the reprocessing and uh, it just spawns off a thread and does processing and then gets back to you with the uh, waveforms. Okay, so it's fairly lightweight processing yeah. that happens to make it. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah thanks. Any other questions for Corey or the LZ team? All right, uh, that seems like uh, it might be time to wrap up now then. All right, thanks everyone for, for attending. Um, the recording of this will be up um, on our web page as well as the slides um, in just a couple of hours. Thanks everyone.